Uh, I read I read an article <laughs> I read an article just a day or two ago about could it uh, could it be that some preachers preach too long? You know, of course I was interested in that, trying to find some justification, and uh, and the author of it said, yeah, you know, it, it's hard. He claimed to be a a fairly spiritual man. He said it's hard for me to really set for more than anything over an hour is just just a little bit too long for me personally, he said, and I think for the attention span of most adults and children today, an hour is probably too much, And uh, but then he said, there are exceptions, and he mentioned one of the translators of the King James Bible, and he was a very popular preacher, and he had had the idea that maybe he preached too long, and he didn't want to take advantage of people, and uh, he preached, they, they had an hourglass that they'd set on the pulpit, and so he'd turn the hourglass over and, and try to be done when that hour's worth of sand ran through the hourglass, and uh, so he had decided to do that to keep from preaching too long and wearing people out, and so after he preached an hour, he stopped and told the people that he didn't want to, uh, didn't want to keep them any longer, and they begged him to preach on, and he turned the hourglass over and, and preached another hour, and as he was about to stop, he said, I, I'm going to quit now. And they begged him not to stop. And he turned the hourglass over the third time. Now, I don't know what happened at the end of the third time, but, but I do know that he preached three hours and the people seemed to be lapping it up. Now, he, he was a much more knowledgeable man than the one you have standing before you now. So maybe, uh, maybe it would be worth it to stand as uh, a sit before a man like him and to hear what he had to say. But evidently back then, I think people did have a longer attention span. I think TV and internet and cell phones and games and so forth has a lot to do with that. We, we're used to uh, seeing uh, the world under attack by space aliens and the certain doom coming and then one or two guys rescues the planet in 30 minutes and it's all over. You know, So uh, I, think, I think a lot of people got the idea if the preacher can't condemn us all to hell and then rescue us and get us to heaven in 30 minutes, we might as well forget it. You know? But I, I, do want to, uh, I do want to bring a message from Matthew chapter number 1. And uh, let's see. Let me find my place here. And let's drop down. Uh, well, actually, let's, let's, just, let's go to directly to chapter 2. We won't read the uh, preliminary there in chapter 1. Go to chapter number 2. And we'll begin reading there. Matthew chapter number 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to, to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to, what's the next word? Worship, worship him. And that's why we're here today, isn't it? We're here to worship him. Verse 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he, command, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And then verse 5 is a, a, a cross-reference from Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now we have the same word worship there, but we know Herod's heart was not being true. He was lying through his teeth because later we find that he killed all the babies, uh, newborns all the way up to two years old, trying to destroy the Lord Jesus. He had no intention but was lying to the, to the wise men in order to try to locate this baby who was a threat to his kingdom in his estimation. Verse 9, 
And when they had heard the king, the wise men, when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star, which they saw in the, in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, it's been speculated that this star was some comet or uh, some phenomenon that was a natural phenomenon. But, I mean, if you've got a virgin birth, that's pretty miraculous, wouldn't you say? And so if we can believe the virgin birth, if we can be, believe the miracle of the resurrection, if we can believe the miracle of the creation of the universe, it wouldn't be a far stretch now to believe that God just had a special star there to come and, and lead them to the right place and stop at the right place. And so I don't have any trouble with that at all. Uh, the Bible is a supernatural book. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. I wish... I, see, they've come to the house where, where the Lord Jesus is. When we come to the house of the Lord, I, I think it's fitting that we come rejoicing too, don't you? I think we can rejoice at the house of the Lord because that's where he chooses to meet us. Verse 11, And when they were come to, into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped. There's a word again, worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, uh, the gold being a very expensive commodity at that time, so was the frankincense and so was the myrrh. Verse 12, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do pray that you'd help us to have a worshipful heart at this time. And Lord, help us to learn and glean some things from this story about the devotion of these wise men. I pray that you'd bless us in this hour. Lord, would you accept our praise and our worship? Would you just look down and see our humble hearts in this room today? Lord, we know that we are nothing but you're everything. And Lord, we worship you in this hour. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. The wise men are said in this passage to have come from the east. And uh, while it's not certain, many, of, many people believe that, that uh, this eastern country would have been Persia or modern day Iraq. And, uh, and we don't know, it doesn't say. But there's some modern myth busters it's always uh, they take great glee in trying to to show the the lack of evidence for many of the things that tradition holds and and uh, it's not certain that they came from Persia but probably and the modern myth busters say they were probably uh, astrologers uh, I think maybe more in line with astronomers than astrologers uh, the Mythbusters tell us that the Bible does not say that they rode camels, which we see on the postcards. Well, the Bible doesn't say they rode camels, but it doesn't say they didn't ride camels either, does it? And if they came eight or 900 miles away, then, uh, you know, bearing gifts and traveling afar and carrying supplies for their journey, it would not be unreasonable to think that perhaps they did ride camels. It doesn't really matter. If the Bible doesn't say, where's our argument? I mean, to argue for camels or to argue against camels would be rather fruitless, don't you think? And then, uh, then in the song we sang a little while ago, in that last hymn we sang, it says, those wise men three. Well, the myth busters say there weren't three of them. The Bible doesn't say there were three. Well, it doesn't say there were three. It only says there were th three types of gifts. And so many have assumed that there were three of them because of the gifts. And maybe there were more. The Bible doesn't say. There could have been five or ten or twenty. I don't know. And I, I don't really think it makes a lot of difference where the Bible doesn't specify. I'm not going to argue that there weren't three. I know people that won't sing that song because the, the song says the wise man three. And there's people who refuse to sing that song because they say it's false. There weren't three. How would they know? The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't say there are three, but it doesn't say there's not three. And so I wouldn't refuse to sing the song based on an assumption. And uh, they say that the wise men didn't come to the, to the manger, uh, that they came some months or 
even up to two years later. And perhaps they did. Again, I don't really care. The truth is the wise men came because they heard of the birth or through the, through the angel that was announced to them, through the reading of the word of God and through the star that led them, they believed that Jesus was born. And so the timing is rather insignificant, like we argue for the 25th date for the birth of Christ. We don't know. Uh, we could say that there's evidence that says it might not be, but there are other evidences that show that it's possible. And so why argue and, uh, and be adamant about those things on which we cannot know? The, they say they didn't see the star until Jesus was already born. Well, again, we do not know. The Bible doesn't say that. God could have put that star in the sky two years ahead of time before Jesus was born so that it would lead them and stop and stay over the, the stable. I'm just saying, I, I'm not going to argue either way. I don't know. I'm just saying that I think the Mythbusters could be a little more humble about, instead of stating categorically that these things are false. They rather could say, we believe the evidence is a little heavier in favor of the fact that the wise men didn't come right away and, and that they, uh, they didn't ride camels, and that's okay. And so that's not even what I want to preach about. I just, I mentioned that because sometimes people get hung up on Christmas about the details of which the Bible doesn't even tell us for sure which way they are. And so rather than get hung up on being able to bust the myths with assumptions, <laughs> I mean the myth busters are using their own assumptions to dispel the myths. And perhaps they're right, I just don't think they've got enough evidence to uh, jump on anybody else about it. Now, if God thought it was important for us to know all those details, I think he would have put them in the Bible. How about you? One thing is certain. Some, one thing is outstanding about their visit. And that is the fact that they were devoted to finding the Christ child. They were devoted to see him and to give him gifts and to worship him. They had devotion. That's what I want to speak about today, the devotion of the wise men. The word devotion in one dictionary is defined this way. Love, listen, love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. Loyalty, love, or enthusiasm for Jesus Christ. I think the wise men give us a, a display of, of devotion and their example suggests several ways that you and I can sharpen our devotion for the Lord Jesus, the one who came to Bethlehem to walk that lonely path that only he could fulfill and die on a cross so that he alone could save us from our sins. And our devotion can be sharpened if we watch what they did and how they responded. Number one, the Magi were devoted men who read and believed God's word. Verse number two says, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come, and are come to worship him. How would they know that? Well, it's been suggested that if they did in fact come from Persia, from somewhere near Babylon, that remember who was over there in years past? When, when, when uh, Judah got carried away captive into Babylon, remember the Hebrew children? Remember the three Hebrew children that got thrown in the fiery furnace? Remember Daniel who was thrown in the lion's den because he kept on praying like he had before? Remember Daniel who wrote that book of the Bible that had great prophecies in it? The Daniel who was a fearless and yet humble servant of the Lord, the one who had direct communication from God? He wrote the scriptures and no doubt some of those scriptures had remained in that area of the world and these wise men would have come in contact with the word of God and found out how that Jesus would be born. And so how else would they know where to go? And so when the star appeared, they began to act upon what they had revealed to them through the reading of the word of God. So here's the first thing that we ought to know, that we can be wise and devoted through the word of God. 
I wish somebody would say amen right there. I want to suggest three ways to you. Listen, three ways. I believe in being practical. I believe in, in being, being heavenly minded, but to be heavenly minded in the right way, we need to have some facts to go with us. I'd like to suggest to you three ways to encounter the Word of God in such a way that it will cause us to be de more devoted to the Lord Jesus Himself. Not to a religion, not necessarily to a church, not necessarily to a movement, but to the Lord Jesus Himself. And so here's three ways. Read for volume. In other words, read through the Bible. Some people choose at this time of year, New Year's Day. They start reading through the Bible. Read three chapters a day and four on Sunday or five. And you'll get, uh, you'll get through the Bible by the end of the year. And so reading for volume covers the expanse of the Bible and familiarizes us with all of the Word of God. And sees, it helps us to see the unity, how all the Word of God fits together. Amen. And, and sometimes we read bits and pieces out of the Bible and we don't see how it fits together. So reading the Bible as a whole, reading it uh, speedily at times to get through it in, a, in a, a shorter period of time is like looking at the picture on the puzzle box. Anybody get a puzzle for Christmas? Anybody get a puzzle? Don't give puzzles anymore? <laughs> well, glory. <laughs> you know, those of us who lived before Noah's Ark remember puzzles that came in a box and on the front of the box, they had a picture, and you could look at that picture as a whole, and before you started putting the individual pieces together, you could look at that picture and get an idea of what that picture is supposed to be when all those pieces are fitted together. And that's the way, reading through the Word of God, uh, whether you choose to do it in a year or six months or two years or however you choose to do it, but in a fairly short period of time, reading through the entire Bible at a quick pace and not stopping to do a lot of study in that particular book, but you're just reading through it to get the content, the main general content. That's one way to contact the scriptures in a way that will draw our devotion to Christ because you know one of the things you'll see when you read through the Bible in a general unifying way, you'll see the Lord Jesus all the way through it. And that will sharpen your devotion to Him. There's a second thing you can do uh, in coming in contact with the Word of God. Not only reading for volume, but number two, reading for study. Reading for study. Reading quickly is a good thing, but then there needs to be times when we slow down. And, uh, and, and perhaps one of the things I do is when I'm reading quickly through the Bible, I'll come to a verse that kind of catches my attention. You ever do that? Or maybe a word or a verse, and you say, well, I need to... I need to understand this a little more deeply, right? And so rather than stop your, your fast reading at that point, you know what I do? I take a pencil so that I can erase it later on if I want to, and I make a question mark in the margin of my Bible right there beside that verse. Just put a question mark and then continue on with my fast readings. So I'm reading for that unity, reading for the volume, and then I'll come back and study those areas out where I put the question mark. That helps us to get in some depth that will flesh out the meat on the bones. And we need to study the Word of God. Some people are, some people are faithful to read quickly through the Bible, but don't ever take time to slow down and study out passages of Scripture. You know, I said, uh, you know, I know some people get up early in the morning, man, they'll read five or ten chapters just like that, man. And it said, you know, the old saying, the early bird gets the worm. But it's the second mouse that gets the cheese. All right? Got a mouse, caught a mouse back here in the kitchen this morning. <laughs> uh, I don't, caught him in the last day or two. We had, this time of year, you got mice that will invade. Anybody else got a mouse problem? <laughs> they want to come inside, you know, when, uh, when it gets cold out. And so they tend to find your food pantry. And, and, uh, and so we started trapping some. Well, the the first mouse that comes along, he gets caught. But after he is deceased, those who come to celebrate his passing tend to eat the cheese. <laughs> it's kind of that way in studying the Bible. We're reading, reading maybe through the Bible. We're going fast. We want to cover a lot of ground, but then put a question mark there or some kind of notation to say, go back and study this more deeply. So then at a different time, not subtracting the time from you've set aside to read through the Bible. You come back at a different time, and then you study more deeply, and you get the meat. 
You get the goods. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, some of you haven't memorized. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, it is work, <laughs> is it not? It is work to study the word of God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Reading passages over and over again, maybe a passage that's been preached at church, maybe passages that were taught on in Sunday school during the week, going back and rereading those passages and studying on your own and, and adding more to it, uh, you can get a, a, a deeper fellowship with the Lord Jesus by studying the word of God. And when you dig out those treasures on your own, they are more valuable to you. When you find it yourself, somebody, uh, I saw somebody posted on the internet uh, on a social site a few days ago, says, anybody else get excited when you find a $20 bill behind your recliner that was yours in the first place? <laughs> you know, if you're just finding something of value, it gets pretty exciting. And it's that way with the Word of God. When you, when you get in there and you discover something, the preacher didn't say it, the Sunday school teacher didn't say it, you found it on your own and you said, hallelujah, man, that's good. <laughs> and you get excited about it. <clears throat> You know, there's ways to study. I, I have books, commentaries. I got software, Bible software. Boy, you can do fast searches with Bible software, and you, and you can study that way. It's a good investment. I, I suggest for young people, instead of buying them an electronic game, teach you how to steal cars and kill people, <laughs> maybe get them some Bible software <laughs> so they can study the Word of God. Uh, that might help. <laughs> that might help. Yeah. Read for speed and volume, but come back and study. Number three, third way I suggest, uh, reading the Bible in order to enhance your devotion for Christ. Are we not here? We're talking about today devotion, the devotion of the wise men. They, they got closer to Christ. They came into his very presence because the word of God was the, scat, the catalyst that brought them there. Number three, reading for devotion. Looking for ways to praise and worship and adore the Lord and to fellowship with Him. You know, it's, it ought to be the bottom line of our fast reading and of our narrowed down studies to ultimately result in a devotional confrontation with Jesus Christ, fellowshipping with Him. I mean, that's that, that thing that warms your heart it doesn't just enhance your knowledge. It doesn't just give you satisfaction knowing that you've read a certain number of chapters, which are all good, but ultimately ought to bring us down to where we say, I walked with God this morning. I met with the Lord this morning. I got out of bed. I got out my Bible. I looked into the Word of God, and He touched my heart. And He puts something on you that will follow you throughout the day. Remember the, the disciples after the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus comes up and encounters them and they don't recognize him because he's in his resurrection body now and they're walking down the road and Jesus is right there with them, talking with them and they don't recognize him until he says something uh, as they get ready to ask the blessing on the food and, and he, uh, he reveals himself to them. And here's what they said afterward. Luke 24, 32. Listen to this. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? <laughs> That's what we ought to be searching for. Reading for volume? Yes. Coming back and studying to enhance our knowledge? Yes. But in the final analysis, we better encounter the Lord Jesus in a devotional way. Personal devotions, family devotions, coming to church, those are all ways to encounter the Lord Jesus. Second thing, the wise men sought Jesus. Not only, not only did they read and believe God's word, but they sought him. They sought him. Wise men seek Jesus, don't they? It seems they have come a long ways. It says in uh, chapter 2, verse number 1, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. 
Now, if it was, in fact, Persia, someplace to the east, had to be someplace over, over yonder that they came from, and it must have been a long ways because uh, if they didn't know anything about what's going on there except they knew the king of kings was supposed to be born, and they had not any other knowledge of that area, so they were from a long ways off, and they came to seek him. They came a long ways. If it was in the area that most believe that would be like eight or 900 miles. That's a long ways to go to church, isn't it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's one of the ways, by the way, you can, you can seek Jesus. Some people seek Jesus by finding a Bible-preaching church, and they may have to drive a ways to get there. All churches are not created equal. Just because there's a church sign out front doesn't mean that Jesus is in the house. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> and... If a person is not profited, if a person is not profited by the, by the unapologetic preaching of the Word of God, if they're not challenged by the Word of God to draw closer to Jesus, to win souls and to know Him more and to live a, a life that's obedient to Him, then maybe they ought to find a different church. Amen? Amen. <laughs> but, not just going to church on Sunday, but but attending all the services and coming to the special meetings, that's a way that you can seek Jesus. Uh, as we stated already, seeking Jesus in the scriptures, reading the Bible, private and personal family devotions, that's a way to seek Jesus. Uh, looking for Jesus, listen to this, looking for Jesus in times of trouble is the time that many people fail to seek Jesus. When you lose a loved one, you need, you need to find the Lord Jesus, don't you, Miss Kathy? When you lose a loved one, it's, you know, people can, people can express their sympathies to you and, and they can be kind to you. And they can, show, they can show not only their sympathy and kindness, they can even give you monetary gifts, but, but nothing quite measures up to the fact that when Jesus shows up, things are better. When, when, you, when you seek Jesus... Many times we seek Jesus when things are going okay. But in times of trouble, we really need to seek Him. I always pray for families who've lost a loved one similar to this. I, uh, I'll pray, Lord, help the lost in that family to come in contact with the gospel. And that's why if you ask me to preach your funeral, I'm going to preach the gospel at your funeral. So don't ask me if you don't want me to preach the plan of salvation because I'm going to tell people how to get saved. I won't pound the pulpit and holler and tell people they're headed straight for hell and, and cry and, and, and run across the tops of the pews and threaten people <laughs> at a funeral. I, I, there's a few preachers who do that. I don't think it's appropriate. But I will preach the gospel. If you ask me to preach the funeral of a loved one, I won't be, I'll try not to be offensive. I'll try not to be mean-spirited. I'll try to be kind and show compassion and sympathy, but I will preach the gospel. Amen. I'll tell people how to be saved, and I will give an invitation. I might not ask them to come down to the altar, but I'll ask for a, for a show of hands. How many of you? I'll explain how to be saved very simply because that's, for some people, the first time they've ever been in a house of worship where they hear the gospel, and I'll explain the gospel. And I'll ask them while their heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer to receive the Lord, would you lift your hand so I can remember to pray for you? Sometimes we've had a number of hands raised, haven't we, Miss Joe? <laughs> when Tommy's funeral, we had, we had, uh, we had a young man, uh, a man saved that uh, at least he came up to me after the, the service and said, uh, Preacher, I just wanted you to know I did pray that prayer. I didn't raise my hand, but I prayed that prayer for the Lord to save me and somebody that nobody else knew about. When Brother Danny Batchelor and Nellie's daughter died and I preached her funeral over at uh, Paragool, I don't remember now. We had about, I think we had like about 10 funerals that summer. And at, I believe it was Danny Batchelor's daughter's funeral over at Paragool. I believe there were, were like 10 people that raised their hands. They received Christ as Savior. We need to seek the Lord Jesus during times of trouble. And so I pray, help the lost to see the gospel and help the grieving ones to be comforted.
Help all of those who are involved to learn any lessons that you're trying to teach them. That's the way I pray. I, I pray for God's grace and love and, and, and his comfort around them. And then I'll pray that God will draw every one of them closer to the Lord Jesus. That's the wise men who wanted to be closer to Christ. Number three, the wise men rec recognized the worth of Christ. Their expensive gifts. Watch this. <clears throat> if you go back down there in uh, verse number 11, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And, and because they worshipped him, because of their heart condition, because they were devoted to him. And that's what we're talking about today, ladies and gentlemen. Being devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Being devoted in our heart. Not just some kind of outward show of religion, but de being devoted in our heart. It touched their heart in such a way. It says, and they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They proved their love. That's what the Apostle Paul said uh, to the Corinthian believers. He said, it's time to prove your love. Don't just say you love somebody, but put, put some shoe leather to what you believe. Put your pocketbook into what you believe. Let your devotion show. How can I be devoted to Christ in a way like these wise men were? First of all, I can give myself to the Lord Jesus. You know what I think he wants more than he wants, more than he wants uh, anything else from you? You know what I think the Lord Jesus wants? I think he wants you personally. I'm not talking about just being saved. He definitely wants you to be saved. But after you're saved, you know what he wants from you more than he wants anything else? He could have created just the angels to serve him. He didn't need us. He wants our love and devotion and our, our, our affection on him. And more than you can give him anything else, you can give him your devotion, your affection, your love, your attention. And if you do that, if you give him yourself, you won't have any problem giving him anything else that he wants. <laughs> yeah. I can offer myself for devoted service to him. I can dedicate my family to him. I can recognize that all of my possessions are really his. I'm only a steward. And when I do that, when I give myself to him completely, then he has control of my life and everything else will work out. And if you're devoted to him and you're in the center of his love, it doesn't matter what goes wrong around you. It'll be all right. Number four, they humble themselves. These wise men humble themselves to worship Jesus. Worship is, is, is allowing myself. It says in, in that verse 11 that we just read, it says, and they fell down and worshipped him. They fell down and worshipped him. It doesn't say that they were clapping their hands and jumping up and down. It didn't say they had a band playing. It didn't say that they were shouting and pulling their shoes off and running around the auditorium. It doesn't say any of that. Sometimes today, we have in our in churches, we have a lot of monkey see, monkey do business. Huh? I mean, there people think that if they just if they just if they create enough motion and try to get enough attention, that they're Jesus. Hey, if I have to stand on my head and turn somersets in order to worship Jesus, I don't think I can find that in the Bible anywhere. You know what? Worshiping. And a lot of churches today, they call, they call the part of the service where they sing the worship service. Well, what is this? What is it? The Word of God brought the wise men to worship. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with singing. I love singing. I love the congregationals. I love the specials. But I'm here to tell you that, that a worship leader is one who draws your attention to Christ and not to those who are showing out. Uh, that's what my mama used to call it, showing out. If I started making a scene, drawing attention to myself, she'd say, son, don't you be showing out. I think a lot of people today are wanting to show out in church and try to, try to draw attention to themselves. Listen, worship is falling on your face and saying, I'm nobody, he's everything. <laughs> that is worship. They humble themselves to worship the Lord Jesus. Number five, and this is my last one, the wise men obeyed God rather than men. 
<laughs> it says in verse 16, after these wise men had went back out of the city a different way, they didn't go back and tell Herod what he wanted to know. They were smart enough to know what he was trying to do. After all, they were wise men. <laughs> Verse 16 says, then, when, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. By the way, there it says two years old and down. Some of those who say that, that they came must have come two years later and, and that's proven by this scripture that would not seem to be reasonable evidence to me because if, if Herod was certain that it was two years ago, he wouldn't have slew, slew the children two years and under. He would have got them from two, he would have got them all the way up to four years old, two years on both sides just to make sure, right? I mean, if it was two years ago, he wouldn't have stopped at two years because when it was two years and a month old, would have got by and could have been him. So, Anyway, that's just my refutation to that argument. But the idea is that the wise men didn't obey Herod. But after all, he's the king. Got to obey the law. Well, I'm for, I'm for obeying the law until they tell me I've got to do something contrary to Scripture. Killing those babies is contrary to Scripture. I say that when it comes, when they pass a law like they have had in China that says that you have to abort your babies, when you have to abort them, disobey the law. There is a time to disobey. Uh, in, in, in fact, in Acts chapter 5, verse 26, it says there when, these, when the apostles had been, uh, had been preaching the gospel and trying to get people saved, it says in verse 26, then when... Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? In what name? In the name of Jesus? They had already said, Look, we've got a command. We've got a law. We've got a rule. You can't preach in the name of Jesus anymore. What did they do? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. When, the, when, when the law comes to the point where it forbids us to obey Scripture, it's time to say, I won't do it. Amen. Netanyahu said uh, they, they want us to throw all of our own people out of the settlements since... Uh, uh, since the current administration and, uh, and the ambassador wouldn't stand up for Israel a few days ago in uh, the UN decision to condemn Israel and make them move out of the settlements of their own land, out of their own houses, out of their own property and give it over to the, to the Muslims in that area. Nobody in America stood up, no officials stood up for Israel. That's sad. God said in Genesis at the very beginning concerning Abraham, the father of the Jews, he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Amen. We're on the wrong side right now. I'm hoping things will change. Uh, about January the 20th, things will maybe change a little bit. And uh, I, I, I agree with Netanyahu, the president of Israel. He said, the UN can declare that if they want to. We ain't moving. We're staying in the house. It's our land. It's our houses. We're not moving out and giving them somebody else. There's a time to obey the law, but when the law commands us to go against God, then it's time to say, hey, it's time for civil disobedience. These men were truly wise men. You know why they were wise? Because they were devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Christmas ought to do for us? Christmas ought to remind us not only of just being kind to people, being kind to our family, and giving gifts, and being kind to the people at Walmart. You know, I went to Walmart two days. I went, I went the eve of Christmas Eve, and I went again yesterday. I just wanted to prove it could be done. <laughs> I survived. I, you know what I did? I made up my mind before I went in there. Lord, I know this is going to be purgatory. 
And so, Lord, I need your grace. When I go in, help me to smile and be kind to everybody, even the one who shoves me off to the side and grabs something out from front of me. Help me to be kind and nice. And, and, and I was able to make I think it is an attitude. Now, I'm still working on that road rage thing a little bit, but help me. Pray for me there. <laughs> you know, it's good. It's good to be kind to people at Christmas. You know what the Lord Jesus wants us to be? He wants us to love him and be devoted to him. And I have a question for you. How devoted are you to Jesus? If he has your heart. Remember what it says in Proverbs? The father in Proverbs said, My son, give me thine heart. If he's got your heart, he's got everything. Would you surrender your heart to him today? Let's pray together, shall we? As we go to the Lord in prayer, and the pianist comes, I want you to think just for a moment. We're taking time right now just to reflect. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and we're just thinking. How devoted am I to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I really worship him? Am I connecting with him in the scriptures? Are my gifts to him reflective of my devotion? Do I seek him? Do I long to be in his presence? Is my Bible reading time a time just to get it done or is it end in a time of devotion and loving and worshiping him? Are you saved? Do you know you're saved? You say you can't, you can't do anything really to please him until you're saved. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's what the scripture says. If you're watching by way of the internet, I want to, I want to in, encourage you right now to believe the message of the Bible. The gospel is that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day, and he's alive today. He paid for your sins on the cross. You cannot come into a relationship with him by being baptized or by turning over a new leaf or by doing better. There's one way to establish a relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's by being born into his family. Jesus said you must be born again. To be born into his family means that you believe he died for your sins and you have faith that his blood and his blood alone can save you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call on him in faith, believing that there's nothing you can do, turning your back on that old way of life, turning that back on those religious works, turning your back on your sin and lust, turning your face towards Jesus in faith, saying, Lord Jesus, I love you and I, I believe you died for me. I accept you as my Savior. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you ask him this morning to save you? Father, I pray that you'd bless the invitation time. Lord, I pray that our devotion would be sharpened and would be intensified, would cause our hearts to be warmed, and Lord, that we might surrender ourselves afresh to you today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand?